morning. Merry Christmas, family. Good to see you guys. What a testimony to your coworkers when, when they ask, what did you do on Christmas? You can say, I went to church. I was with my church family. <laughs> a little conviction for them. <laughs> All right, we're going to talk briefly this morning. Nothing new, just some reminders of what this season is all about. I've entitled this message, Meant to Be Together. Mm. Meant to be together at Christmas. Father, thank you for this day. Thank you for what we're here to celebrate. Thank you for our forever family that we get to celebrate you, not just today, not just tomorrow, not just next week, but forever. We get to celebrate you, and thank you for coming into the world to redeem us. So, Father, as we hear your word this morning, we pray that the Spirit of God would speak to each and every heart under the sound of my voice. There's so much to be distracted about today and during this season. Lord, help us hear what you want us to hear this day. Well, thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Christmas season, busiest time of the year. Thousands of people, millions of people celebrating a holiday without ever thinking about this is supposed to be a holy day. The real meaning of Christmas become lost in the midst of unnecessary spending, stressful celebrations, and the friendliness that only lasts for a couple weeks. <laughs> Have you noticed that people are going to be saying, Merry Christmas, Merry Christmas, and this time next month they won't speak to you. <clears throat> What's that about? <laughs> See, those of us who really understand what Christmas is about will treasure relationships while we have the limited opportunity to do so. You ever stop to think about the sovereign actions of God that brought you into his family for an eternal relationship? You ever stop to think about the countless relationships he brought together so that you would be born? Think about that. This morning we're going to talk a little bit about meant to be together at Christmas and the relationships that we're in that you know, we think we chose them. But sometimes God is reminding us, I actually chose them for you. It just took you a minute to realize that. <clears throat> a little bit of background, Mary and Joseph were godly people. They're ordinary people, just like most of us. They chose to be in a relationship. They planned to get married. And later on, they found out that really God chose to bring them together for a much higher purpose than they had realized. He chose to bring them together for his, for his glory. Remember, Jesus would say things like, you, you didn't choose me, but I chose you and ordained you that you would go forth and bring forth much fruit. And so people wrestle all the time with the sovereignty of God and, and the free will of man. And you can get a headache trying to figure that out. But one day you realize that even the choices I made, there was a sovereign God behind so many of those choices. We're going to talk about Mary and Joseph for a minute in section one. God brings people together for higher purposes than we realize. <clears throat> this past Friday, Anita and I celebrated 44 years of holy matrimony. <laughs> now we go places and I, I'm telling people, we've been married 44 years. <clears throat> and then they look at her and say, you don't look like you could possibly have been married 44 years. They don't tell me that. They tell her that. <laughs> so I said, was that like Mary and Joseph, an older dude with a younger woman kind of thing? Why don't they ever tell me that? <clears throat> but, but somewhere along the line, we realized God brought us together to do ministry. And had we been with any other person, neither one of us would be where we are today. He's opened incredible doors of ministry that we both realize if we had not been together, this would not have, would not have happened. And so Mary and Joseph are planning to get 
Mary, not realizing God had a bigger plan behind that. See, if you look at letter A in section 1, God's promise of a savior for the world had to come through the family line of King David. And when you read Matthew and Luke's account of the genealogy, you find out both of them were in David's family line. Back in 2 Samuel chapter 7, when David wanted to build a house for God, and he, God wouldn't let him do that, he said, I'll let your son Solomon build it, but because it's on your heart, I'm going to establish your house forever. You'll always have a son. You'll always have a descendant to be the king of Israel. So every Jewish person knew their Messiah had to be a fleshly descendant of David. So why Joseph and Mary? Great question. Let it be. The same God who brought Adam and Eve together drew Joseph and Mary together. So their firstborn son could reunite two lines of heirs to the throne. If you remember the story, David had more than one wife. See, God records what people did. He doesn't always say he wanted them to do it. So, he had different children by different wives, but the promise was one of your sons would be king of Israel forever. So, the lineage was passing down through one family line. And then one of those leaders by the name of Jeconiah did something so horrible that God said, no more of your sons will ever be king. And so he passed the line on to a different son of David. So down through history, you had descendants of David who theoretically either could have been the king. One kind of had the legal right, but the other one's also in the bloodline. It, it just so happens when Joseph and Mary came together they brought those two lines back together in their firstborn son. That's right. They didn't know all that. They weren't thinking about that. But it was no coincidence that Joseph and Mary fell in love, got married, and God gave them the son who would live forever, the Lord Jesus Christ. He's, he's so far ahead of us in these things. <laughs> that took hundreds of years. To bring those two together. He brings people together for higher purposes than we realize. Will you stop and think this Christmas season that about the relationships he's placed in your life? And say, I wonder why God's connected me with these people. And not just your spouse, but some of the other people. He's, he's, he's got a much higher purpose than we're thinking about. Number two. God's plan for us may go against all that we had planned for ourselves. Trust him even when it makes no sense to you. Matthew 1, verse 18. Now the birth of Jesus Christ was as follows. After his mother Mary was engaged to Joseph, before they came together, before they had any sexual intimacy, she was found with child of the Holy Spirit. And Joseph, her husband, being a just man, being an upright man, being a godly man, did not want to make her a public example, was minded to put her away secretly, privately. The woman I love was pregnant. And we've never been together. And she says she's not been with anybody else. But can you imagine how that story would have first hit? <clears throat> can you imagine if Joseph did not know the Old Testament scripture? That there actually had been a prophecy of a virgin who would get pregnant and bear the Messiah. See, if he didn't know that, and Mary had come to him and talked about she pregnant by the Holy Spirit. <laughs> you talking about six o'clock news. <laughs> <laughs> I 
But even hearing that story, you notice he said, okay, I, I don't want to humiliate this woman because I love her, but he's, he's got every right to be devastated and, and angry, but he was going to privately break it off rather than humiliate her publicly or have her stoned to death for a fornicator. A godly man. Because he knew the scripture. Look at verse 19. Then Joseph, her husband, being a just man, a godly man, an honorable man, not wanting to make her a public example, was minded to put her away privately, but while he thought about these things. Remember we said a few weeks ago how important it is to think before you act. Don't let your emotions get ahead of your mind. Don't let your emotions get ahead of God telling you what to do. While he thought about these things, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, saying, Joseph, son of David. Joseph was one of those in line to be king. And if we got it right, had they not been in captivity, he would have been sitting on the throne. Amen. Don't be afraid to take to you Mary, your wife, for that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Spirit, and she will bring forth a son. You shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. All this was done that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the Lord through the prophet, saying, Behold, the virgin shall be with child and bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which is translated God with us. I, I like to say it this way, because you know what El means God, right? I like to say, not just God with us, but for the first time in history, they could say with us is God. Because God was going to be incarnate in human flesh. But see, Joseph had a framework. He knew the scripture. He knew that the promise had been made roughly 700 years before. And now God intervenes in his life and says, you and your bride are going to be the parents of the Holy One. You're talking about a change of plan. You're talking about pressure. We are going to raise the son who created us. That's a little awkward, isn't it? What a responsibility God gave to ordinary godly people. Will you stop and think why God has placed certain people into your life? He's got a much higher purpose. He was going to use them in mighty ways. Do you really want to be used by God? You realize that might change your plans for your life? As you think about that, please, please admit that you really won't ever be satisfied and totally fulfilled until you find out what he put you here for. Okay? But look at letter C for a moment. As you look in Matthew 124, Then Joseph, being aroused from sleep, did as the angel of the Lord commanded him and took to him his wife, and did not know her, didn't have sexual relationships with her until after she had brought forth her firstborn son. And he called his name Jesus. Look at letter C. Don't miss this. Notice that Joseph was a man who allowed his actions to speak louder than his words. We have no record of anything Joseph said. Yet we will never forget all that he did to protect his wife and to protect the holy child that he was responsible for. We're going to look at a couple other incidents here in this gospel where God speaks to Joseph in a dream. And all we see him doing is getting up and doing what God said with no talk back. No questions, just doing with God. Ladies, I have to say, there's only a few brothers out here like that, okay? <laughs> the, the pickings are slim, okay? 
But, but that's the kind of godly man and the godly woman that you are. Somebody who will just do what God says. Don't try to figure it out first. Just do it first. Okay? That's what you're going to see Joseph doing. And oh, by the way, if you look at letter D, Mary's going to have her reputation ruined for decades. And her life plans changed forever by God's intrusion into her life. But she bowed to his will. She praised him, just like you and I should always do. Because his plans for us are always better than our own plans. Mary's a teenage girl with plans like any other woman would make. Now she's pregnant, pregnant by the Holy Spirit. This has never happened in human history before. And you know most people did not believe that story. You, you pray, who's, who's the father? Holy Spirit. <laughs> Come on, Mary. <laughs> I might have been born at night, but it wasn't last night. Come on, Mary. Do you expect me to believe that you're pregnant and you've not been with anybody? She had to endure that for decades. Remember the, the, the wedding in Cana and she wanted Jesus to, to make the wine? Out of water. She's waiting for him to manifest who he is. Because for 30 years, she's had to put up with what people thought about her character as she obeyed the Lord. That's a long time to wait, isn't it? Not 30 minutes, 30 years of people thinking that you've been lying all this time. Because Jesus hadn't done anything special for 30 years. But now she's eternally vindicated. Amen. Now she would say, you know what? It was worth the wait. <laughs> so we have to remind ourselves when we're going through a tough season that it's still worth the wait. To wait on God to, to do what he planned to do. <clears throat> Because most of us haven't realized yet what he has us here for. We're just focused on the hard time. Joseph and Mary had their plans changed. And it was tough. But God knew who he was working with. I got two godly saints here. They wouldn't have chosen it this way. But forever they'll be glad that God chose it that way. Okay? You've read Luke 1, you see Mary just singing praises. Her spirit rejoicing in God, her Savior. For all my Catholic friends, that should answer a question. She called God her Savior, not God the co-Savior with me. Okay? God, my Savior. If, if she hadn't sinned like everybody else, she wouldn't need a Savior. Sinners need a Savior, right? Okay. See, the, the answers to these questions in the Bible, but people just miss them. Okay? She never claimed to be what people say about her. She was a godly woman, chosen by God to bear the Messiah. What a privilege. And God gave her the right husband, a godly man, who just did whatever God told him to do, no matter how inconvenient it might have been. As we move to our last section. And don't think I'm going to be this brief on normal Sundays, okay? No. <laughs> this, this is just your Christmas gift. You get a short sermon. Okay? <laughs> <laughs> when God brings people together, they should be able to handle difficulties and joys without destroying 
their relationship. Some people get blessed and they can't handle it. When they were broke, they're hugging each other, praying all the time. <laughs> Got some money and ran their separate ways. What's up with that? When God brings people together, they should be able to handle the ups and the downs the right way. The difficulties and the joys without destroying the relationship. You're familiar with Matthew chapter 2, a story that takes place uh, not the night he was born, but a time later. You're familiar with the story as the wise men travel hundreds of miles to come and find the one who's been born king of the Jews, which greatly upset Herod because he thought he was king of the Jews. They said, we've seen his star, we've seen this blazing forth in the sky that indicated that he has been Born, You connect that all the way back to Daniel when he was placed in charge of the Magi and teaching them the prophetic word that, that one day there'd be a blazing forth in the heavens that would indicate the Messiah was born. And Jesus says the same thing in Matthew 24, 25 when he talks about his return. He says that the skies will be darkened and then the sign of the Son of Man will appear in heaven. It's the same thing you see in Matthew 2. That a point in time is going to come when there'll be a blazing forth in the sky that is the sign, not a star, the sign of the Son of Man coming back right. to earth. Blazing forth in glory. The Magi had followed that star, that blazing forth, that shining that indicated he had been born. So they come into Jerusalem with their entourage and where is he? Where's the king? Herod angry, puzzled. The whole city stirred up because when a madman like Herod got upset, everybody was scared because they didn't know what he was going to do. Right. Historians tell us that they didn't even record him wiping out the little boys in Bethlehem because that was minor. They, they missed the significance of that because he'd done so many atrocities. They didn't know why he was killing those boys. Holy Spirit wanted us to know. So Herod asked his wise men and they say, Micah said he's going to be born in Bethlehem. Pastor Aaron taught us yesterday, Bethlehem Ephratah. See, there was more than one Bethlehem in that region. It looks like there's Cleveland, Ohio and Cleveland, Tennessee. God was very specific as to which Bethlehem he was going to be born in. It's interesting that these wise men had come hundreds of miles. The scholars knew that Micah said Bethlehem right down the road, less than 10 miles. They hadn't even gone to look. And Jesus is not a baby at this point because a different word is used. It's a word for infant, not a newborn. They've had all this time if they cared, but they didn't. Kind of like a lot of people today, so, so close to the truth, but they won't make the effort to find out. There are other people going out of their way to find out. These folks wouldn't go down the road a few miles to see if this was true. The wise men found them. They got blessed. They worshiped. But now, verse 7, Herod, when he'd secretly called the wise men, determined from them what time the star appeared, sent to Bethlehem, said, Go search carefully for the young child when you find him. Bring back word to me that I may come and worship him also. You know the story. Herod wanted to kill him. So they go to, they follow the star again. They follow that blazing forth in the sky. They come to Jesus in verse 11. They didn't worship Mary. They worshiped Jesus. They gave him the gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. And then in verse 12, being divinely warned in a dream, they should not return to Herod. They departed for their own country another way. 
Verse 13, when they had departed, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream, saying, Arise, take the young child and his mother, flee to Egypt, and stay there until I bring you word, for Herod will seek the young child to destroy him. When he arose, he took the young child and his mother by night and departed for Egypt. Now think, if most men had been Joseph, he said, wait a minute, God. This is the Christ child, right? So isn't there some supernatural power available? Why I got to pack up and move down to Africa when you could just do something supernatural? There is no record of Joseph asking any questions. He just did what God told him to do. Verse 15, was there until the death of Herod that it might be fulfilled, which is spoken by the Lord through the prophet, saying, out of Egypt, I've called my son. You see that in Hosea. But the ultimate fulfillment is the son of God also came back from Africa. Egypt is in Africa, by the way. Some, some people forget that. Okay. <laughs> Verse 16, then Herod, when he saw he was deceived by the wise men, was exceedingly angry, sent forth and put to death all the male children who were in Bethlehem, in all of its districts, two years old and under. There's your proof that he wasn't just a little newborn. According to the time which he had determined from the wise men, that fulfilled another prophecy from Jeremiah. Jump down to verse 19. Now when Herod was dead, behold... An angel of the Lord appeared in a dream to Joseph in Egypt, saying, Arise, take the young child and his mother, go to the land of Israel, for those who sought the young child's life are dead. Then he arose, took the young child and his mother, came back to the land of Israel. But when he heard that Archelaus was reigning over Judea instead of his father Herod, he was afraid to go there. That means Archelaus was even worse than Herod. <laughs> and being warned by God in a dream. You notice God keeps giving Joseph instruction to keep them safe. Yes. And being warned by God in a dream, he turned aside into the region of Galilee. Came and lived there in a city called Nazareth that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the prophets. He shall be called a Nazarene. You see how God led them step by step to fulfill scripture and to keep them safe through ordinary means and supernatural means at the same time. Did you catch that? He had them moving physically, but at the same time, he was protecting them supernaturally. See, that's, that's why it's so important just to do what God says. Not try to figure it out first, not try to tell him what to do first. Lord, this this moving, this is hard. This, you know, they're not catching a plane to go back and forth. They're walking, they're riding donkeys, they're, they're traveling dusty roads. And they're saying, God could have done this another way, but he did. You know, sometimes he takes you through things that develop character. To see if you really trust him. Letter A. Joseph obeyed the Lord and provided care for his family. Mary followed his lead. God was glorified as they were satisfied. I remember my bride telling me she has no problem following a man who's following the Lord. Amen. That's how it's supposed to work. See, if both of you get in step with the Spirit of God, some incredible things can happen. Okay? And this just isn't about marriage relationships because God will have a lot of people bring him glory and stay single. That's why I have letter B on there. When believers are brought together in a local church family and recognize that God brought them together for reasons they may not yet see, they should choose to work together and obey the Lord as they discover his purpose together. 
So, so in this relationship that we have, of marrieds and singles and older folks and middle-aged folks and real young folks, God wants us to discover why he's put us in this family relationship. Because he's got something bigger planned that we don't always see. So the important thing to do is just keep obeying, obey the instructions, we'll find out why when he's ready to show us, okay? Stop thinking these are coincidental relationships. God was at work behind the scenes. So let's not abort his process by bailing out too soon, okay? You, how would you feel if somebody ran away every time something got difficult? You don't want the fireman coming to your house, oh, it's hot in there, I can't. <laughs> <laughs> That's why we're here. <laughs> the journey of life, let us see, is enriched when you walk with others who do not trust their logic or their own solutions, but have learned to obey the Lord no matter what. I close with this. Many people are not sure who they were meant to be, or who they were meant to be with. Rest assured that you were meant to be with Jesus. Yes. He is the perfect gift. Trust his choice. Trust his plan for your life. Isaiah wrote about this place in Galilee. Galilee of the Gentiles. Jesus was going to be called a Nazarene. The area he was living in for a while was a despised area that people said nothing good can come out of Galilee. That's not how God looked at it. Because the people who walked in darkness have seen a great light. Those people in Galilee. Those who lived in the land of the shadow of death Upon them, a light has shined. It's pretty dark out here at times, isn't it? Yes, it is. But we still have the light of the world. Yes, we do. The Lord Jesus Christ to illuminate our path, to show us the way. He's the perfect gift forever. God bless you, family.